Damaged Defenders by Sherza. Chapter 137. Tony. Tony was literally bouncing on his toes hard enough that he was audibly leaving the ground and hitting it again by the time Hulk and fully retreated into Bruce. Doing that in the suit was absolutely not as easy as it looked, in no small part because an only slightly stronger version of that action could launch him into flight. So we had to be very careful about how hard he bounced. Also, the suit was quite heavy, nowhere near as bad as the Mark I had been, but still. The hydraulics helped, but Tony was still lifting close to 100 pounds when he was walking on the ground in the thing. There was a reason Tony had nearly as much muscle definition, just in a wirier format, as the more bulked out Avengers. All that said, right now, Tony was so excited he was practically coming out of his skin, so little wonder he was managing to bounce on his toes in the suit, because holy crap! They'd all of them been making assumptions about Hulk. Not to be mean or judgmental or anything, just... Nobody, not even Betty, had a real clear idea about much of anything regarding the Hulk. Knowledge pretty much stopped that he hates Ross and Thunderstorms and will literally do anything to keep Betty safe. Even with Charles having told them that Hulk had the capacity to someday be a normal adult human, they'd made assumptions as to how long getting there would take, simply because they had absolutely no data to work from where Hulk was concerned. Hulk had just blown those assumptions not only out of the water, but off the planet. Even Betty, who knew Hulk best, had it figured on him taking part in training for at least another month, mostly due to Hulk's rather negative associations with combat in any form. Then all of them assumed it would take time to get Hulk to understand training, never mind be able to take part without losing his crap and smashing everyone in sight. Especially since Bruce could really only transform once a week without paying for it in unpleasant ways. Hulk had, today, made it really clear that while he might not know much and while he had very little in the way of vocabulary, he was not anywhere near being stupid. If Tony had to guess at this point, he'd guess that Hulk had at worst an IQ somewhere in the 110 to 130 range. Lower than Bruce's IQ, but still above average. At best, Hulk had Bruce's IQ in full. Because seriously... Hulk had asked to train with the team, had asked for himself and Logan, and Tony was never not going to stick her at Hulk's name for Logan. Yeah, it had been Tony's idea to limit the first attempt at training to one or two of the team, but the choice of who had been Hulk's entirely. And Tony could about see the logic Hulk had used in his choice. Logan, he'd worked with, if only briefly, during the mini invasion, so Hulk probably figured he could do it again. And Tony, well, Hulk made no bones about who he liked and who he hated. Ross's name never failed to come out of Hulk's mouth in anything less than a hateful snarl. By the same token, Betty's name, oh but got coon. And Tony's name, while not Betty levels of happy to see you slash like him a lot, wasn't too far from it but with more delighted anticipation thrown into the mix. Probably because, unlike Betty, Tony smashed, which was clearly something Hulk enjoyed. So Hulk had chosen one of his favorites, and someone he knew was quite capable of smashing at near Hulk levels, and who was probably not coincidentally rather difficult to hurt for more than about 10 minutes at the most. Because that was the other thing. Hulk had... Well, he'd responded like someone who had a long and very bad history with physical violence. Tony hadn't missed the near attacks aimed his and Logan's way during the first run with Hulk. He also hadn't missed the fact that not one of those near attacks followed through. Which was stunning in and of itself. As someone with PTSD, even if he never admitted such out loud, Tony could aver that it was hell all harder to stop yourself from going on the attack when you got triggered in that way than a lot of people tended to think. Poor Pepper had ended up with bruises more than once before she'd figured out how to avoid doing things that had a high likelihood of Tony going on the offensive without meaning to. Rhodey, thanks to being Air Force and a lot more familiar with PTSD and its crap, had managed to avoid getting hit, but there'd been more than one very close call. Yet Hulk had managed to check himself and not follow through on the impending physical violence the instant he realized Tony and Logan were not threats. So yeah, impressive. Especially considering this was the first time poor Hulk was getting a chance to knowingly work with a team.
The mini invasion didn't count. That had mostly been Hulk smashing stuff in the general vicinity of people he had no desire to smash simply because there were so many other targets to choose from. On top of that, they'd gotten a good look at Hulk's fighting style, strategy, and tactics when he was a whole heck of a lot calmer than he usually was when he popped out. Granted, even pissed as heck and doing more than a little flailing because he didn't know what was going on, aside from his being shot at. Again, Hulk had shown more than a small ability at strategy and tactics whenever he'd fought. The recordings, few and shaky as they were, of the fights with Blonsky in Harlem have been particularly informative, not to mention spectacular. Unsurprisingly, Hulk was pretty much the definition of a combat pragmatist. Given that he didn't even know there were supposed to be rules to fighting, it was hardly a shock that he ignored them in favor of winning. Things like ripping arms and hands off was... Well, brutal as heck, even when employed against a metal non-living opponent, but it was also effective as hell in rendering said opponent either unable to fight at all, or at the very least making them a whole heck of a lot easier to smash. Best yet, Bruce, while obviously tired from the transformation, clearly had either full memory of what Hulk had been up to or very close to it. Tony had noticed that as Bruce started accepting Hulk and stopped fighting him all the time, he was remembering more and more of what Hulk did when Hulk was out. And Tony knew this because of what Bruce said pretty much the moment he was fully back. You know, I really don't envy Hydra when Hulk gets a chance at them. He is severely pissed about what they did to Bucky. Bruce's words were a little slurred with exhaustion, but otherwise understandable. No, really? Tony drawled, trying not to laugh. I think we got that memo when the two of them met. When Hulk, you know, more or less used Bucky as a teddy bear for like half an hour. Okay, so it hadn't been that long, but that stuff had been hilarious. Concerning at the time, because no one had known how Bucky would take getting snatched up like that, but really hilarious in retrospect. And also, Tony was so looking forward to aiming a fully understanding Hulk at Hydra. That was going to be beautiful. Painful as heck for Hydra, but beautiful. And given that no one had said a thing about Hydra to Hulk today, that meant that Bruce was remembering what Hulk had been thinking at some point. Up to now, the only things Bruce had commented on were things Hulk had done. It didn't necessarily mean Bruce didn't remember Hulk's thoughts, of course, but whoa. Just Bruce being willing to cop to remembering Hulk's thoughts was an improvement on the two's coexisting. Bruce have to laugh. Okay, so Hulk's kind of obvious about his favorites. Dry about everything, Jolly Green. Tony told him with his work, he should never, ever try playing poker. Or anything else that requires any level of not showing what you're thinking with your expression. On the one hand, trying to teach Hulk about Poker face? Wouldn't be interesting. Tony filed the idea away for later use. First, they needed to get Hulk up to speed on what things were, how to count, how to write, that sort of thing. Which, for the record, Tony kind of wanted to go drag Ross out of jail and airdrop the bastard without a shoot from 30,000 feet. Because if it hadn't been for him, Hulk would know at least some of that stuff by now. Tony finally turned his attention back to the X-Men who had kind of been being ignored while everyone checked in with Bruce. So, same time two weeks from now, Batty's willing? Tony asked. By then, the other realm folks would have all had their tours of Earth and the solar system and hopefully things would have died down just a tad. Hopefully. God, this next year was going to be insane, more or less non-stop at this rate. Tony hoped it had calmed down, but he knew to plan for the worst. Sounds good, Scott agreed. We don't have anything scheduled at that point. Right. Speaking of, Thargeen and Paul Thor and their entourages ought to be here in like an hour to do their end of the meet and greet. Tony said he'd told them a fairly latish time for the meetup because of the two teams need to practice together. Which they were definitely going to need to do again because even Tony, who had almost zero experience working with a team, could tell there'd been problems today. Stuff that it'd take time and effort to iron out, if it could be. Tony was pretty sure that literally everyone had made do mental note to keep Loki and Jean as far away from each other as was possible. Permanently. Because 
Wow. Talk about a personality clash and a verbal war that almost literally managed to draw blood. Fortunately for everyone, they both also seemed content to ignore each other when they weren't forced to work together. So at least the entire practice time hadn't been full of that. Tony kind of hoped that at least some small part of that viciousness had been Loki venting his plan about having to be anywhere near Jotuns in less than 48 hours. Absolutely none of the Avengers were looking forward to that. Steven actually made noises about excusing Loki from that meetup because they all knew Loki was likely to lose it. It had actually been Tony who'd pushed to keep Loki at the meetup with the Jotuns because, yeah, Loki was going to lose it dealing with Jotuns. Better they get as much of that reaction out of the way now as they could and start at least habituating Loki to the presence of Jotuns, even if getting him to be anywhere near tolerant was impossible. They did not want Loki losing it when Thanos was in town, so to speak, because that was the first time he'd had to be anywhere near Jotun since Farbani's ill-fated visit. Honestly, if Tony ever saw Odin again, only one of them was going to walk away from that encounter because what he'd pulled on Loki was so far beyond the bail, it was ridiculous. It was entirely possible that Loki would spend the rest of his life thinking of himself and his entire bird species as monsters, which would eat thousands of years because let's not forget that Loki was still, if only barely, in the equivalent of the teenage years as far as either Asgardian or Jotun lifespans were concerned. Sheesh. And Tony had thought Howard was a bad parent. Odin brought a whole new meaning to the term. Thank God for Darcy. She had very clearly elected herself as Loki's pepper and was doing a good job of it. She'd gotten him calmed down, and from what she'd said, stopped him from bolting in anticipation of getting kicked out after Farbani's visit, and had managed to help with lesser moments before and after that. She'd also given Thor solid advice more than once, and helped the big guy to not accidentally step on Loki's toes. Which, credit to Thor, he realized he needed to walk softly, and had sought out advice on how to go about doing that. Tony actually really liked Darcy. She was... deceptive. To look at her, or hear her talk half the time, you'd be forgiven for assuming she was a brainless floozy. But without fail, when things got real, or it was something important, she'd stepped up to the plate and knocked it out of the park in fine pepper style. She was maybe not quite as frighteningly competent as Pepper so effortlessly was, but yeah... Tony really, and he meant really, wanted to see what she could do in her chosen field of politics once she'd gotten a little experience under her belt. It would be epic and very probably hilarious because politics were mostly men and Tony knew damn well that most men would look at Marcy and, well, make assumptions. Tony didn't mess with politicos as much as he had back in SI's weapon-making days, but he still had to deal with them enough he'd be able to see the fallout. Let's it up, Scott said. Dinner will be in a couple of hours, and you guys are all invited if you want. Scott said. He gave Tony a look that Visor be damned still managed to look half amused and half exasperated. I know you'll want to hang out with the kids. So Tony liked the vast majority of the brats at the mansion. Sue him! There were several he was actively mentoring in hopes of stealing them for SI when they were old enough. Kitty Pride, in particular, was damn near Tony's equal when it came to computers. He would not put it past her to be able, in a few years, to create her own AI. Forge! Yeah! Tony wanted that kid at SI badly, because his mutation meant he was able to invent and build any damn thing he wanted as long as it was mechanical in nature. With Forge in particular, well, better he work for Tony if he wanted to try to work in the wider world than for damn near anyone else. Tony at least would not abuse the kid and his ability, and Tony had the money and clout to protect the kid if assholes started sniffing around him. Granted, cornering Forge would end every bit as badly for his attackers as cornering Tony tended to, if not worse, but still, the kid shouldn't have to deal with that if at all possible.